Since October of 2017, intrigue and mystery have surrounded Luis Elizondo. He says he headed a secret UFO study known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP. But his journey telling the story about his career within the Department of Defense has been challenged by the Pentagon every step of the way. After years of seeking a paper trail to either prove or disprove his story, the Black Vault made a discovery that has turned the entire saga upside down. According to the Pentagon, they destroyed Elizondo's email box. Now the importance of this is that box resides on a short list of evidence that could help solve the mystery of what really happened during Elizondo's days working within the classified intelligence world. The biggest question when it was all over was whether or not the Department of Defense had proper authorization to destroy the data. And when asked, they were unable to prove it after nearly two months. This is the story behind what really happened these past few years to unravel the entire mystery. So stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your live stream or your podcast of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., and thank you for deciding to today take this journey inside the Black Vault with me. What we are talking about is, in my opinion, the single most important story that I have ever written on the ATIP saga, that is the rumored Pentagon UFO study, and Mr. Luis Elizondo himself. Now, the reason why I say that is because I believe it. I believe with what happened throughout this entire saga with me trying to essentially unravel the mystery on what really is going on with this program, what ultimately went down is incredibly important. And it actually goes to the heart, the soul of why I do what I do. As you know, I started when I was 15 hammering the government with the Freedom of Information Act. And I believed in two things, transparency and preservation. Now, although I felt that there were some reasons for withholding information, and I do still believe that to this day, I was a strong advocate for transparency and preservation. So whenever I hear, no matter what the topic is, that something is destroyed or deleted, uh, it's a punch in the gut because I truly believe in the preservation of that history, especially with this topic, because they have seemingly been launching an attack about one of their own, one of their former own, where an employee comes out, he says what he did on the inside, and they start slinging mud. Is it true? Is it not? I don't know. As It's no secret. I've been real critical of the man myself. But when it started to get dirty, that's when it got really bizarre to me. And we'll go through some of that today. But that is what this show is all about. Now, if you follow me on social media, you'll see that yesterday I published this article. I was... Uh, entrenched in this thing for months. The research itself goes back three years. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about what that story is now and where we're at. Because if you didn't read the article, I recommend you do so. But I do understand it's long and it's detailed, but it had to be. And that is why it has taken this long for me to ultimately come out with it simply because I had to dot every I, cross every T, triple and quadruple check what I was coming out with. Because if I was wrong, 
I, I wouldn't have forgiven myself, let alone the fact that I think a lot of you all would not have done so either, just simply because the claim is huge. Yet, when it was all said and done, I could not find a reason not to publish this. Now, here's the quick synopsis. Luis Elizondo, the man who says that he directed that secret Pentagon UFO study that we all know is the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or you'll hear me say ATIP. Well, the true value of a paper trail would either prove or disprove his story. Now, if you have followed not only the, the Black Vault, but this entire saga, you'll know that there have been a lot of challenges and hurdles for this guy to overcome. Now, again, true or not, if you believe him or not, it doesn't matter. They're hurdles nonetheless. So if he's telling the truth, hurdles. If he's lying, well, they're hurdles because he had to get by him. So he had a lot of challenges that were thrown at him. And yet he just kept marching forward. That was always impressive to me. And as critical as I was for him to communicate with me once I was finally able to get a direct line with him, come on my show and take some of those difficult questions, I admire that. And 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 it probably wasn't the easiest of all things to do because you have the weight of the Pentagon saying that he didn't do certain things. Now, the big one was that he didn't play a role in the program he said he did. But before we get there, that wasn't the beginning shot. And the beginning shot actually came, if you could believe it, through the Freedom of Information Act, even before the December 17, 2017 article from the New York Times and Politico that broke the story of ATIP and took Luis Elizondo's story to the next level. Yes, there was a shot fired prior to that. Now, why do I say it? Well, when Luis Elizondo first came onto the scene in October of 2017, I literally was there watching it live, not there physically, but but on the internet where it streamed live and, and taking notes because the most intriguing aspect to that, and it always has been, even despite the mud, was Luis Elizondo because he was the guy that that ultimately was proving something that not only myself but others had been saying for decades. The government did have an interest in UFOs. They were investigating them and they were a potential threat. That is something that has been so wildly overlooked from the Pentagon and the Department of Defense and the government and the intelligence community for decades. It, it couldn't have been anything else but a lie. That's why I was such an advocate for, for pressing for more information and digging through the Freedom of Information Act. Elizondo proved all of that with that original press conference. But as time went on, those red flags started to appear, those questions started to appear. And back to that first what I call shot against Elizondo came on a November 27th, 2017. Because while I was taking notes that day, I had filed Freedom of Information Act requests uh, for information. I believe it was maybe the, the next day, the next morning. But uh, regardless, I mean, within 24 hours of Elizondo storming out on that stage, uh, I was going after records. It took till only November, a fairly quick turnaround time for the DOD to tell me that the program that Elizondo described, keep in mind, ATIP had not been named in October. The name was never public until December. Obviously, journalists were working on it, but nobody was chatting about it. There was no public citable material that I can bring to you. It was only Elizondo's description, which essentially was described as an aerial threat program that was that they were looking at essentially those aviation threats, those aerial threats that um, included UFOs. And so that was his description. So the way that I worded it to the DOD was just that, that there was a program that was identifying aerial threats. I used Elizondo's testimony. It was public and sought after information. Using only the description that Elizondo said, that's generally enough to a FOIA officer. What came back was that the DO said, we got nothing. We have no records responsive to your request. Now, I have since appealed that. I've won that appeal since 2018. 
uh, at the end of 2017 going into 2018, won that appeal. It is still ongoing. So despite what I'm about to tell you in, in, in this video, just know that this particular case is actually still open and the appeal is, is uh, granted. Regardless, though, that was a red flag to me because I thought, well, look, this guy's out there talking about it, which means it's it's likely not classified. Why would they have motivation to lie about it? So to anybody who researches government documents, that part didn't make sense to me. And that was always a red flag. And, and I never I never had any problems uh, even to this day bringing that up, because if he is talking about it, you can establish that there is no classification about the existence of the program. That doesn't mean that aspects of it, portions thereof deal in classified information, but the existence of it was not. So why would they say that there was no records? So that's why I appealed and ended, ended up winning the appeal. The second shot was the big one. And this is where I just kind of like, if you look at what I was saying publicly and stuff like that and followed the timeline, this is when I backed off. I'm like, okay, this is going into an area that I did not expect. And this was then in, in, uh, in 2019, The Intercept had published this article. I was floored when this statement came out. And you'll find me in the article. Uh, you know, I was cited in one particular section because I was asked for uh, a little bit of detail about what was going on because I was digging into this. But as skeptical as I was, when the Pentagon sent this out, and I know that The Intercept wasn't the first to receive it, but they were the first to report it, I had confirmed it as well to ensure that it was a valid statement, uh, and it was. That's when I backed off. I went, okay, this is, I don't mean to laugh about it, but getting really bizarre. Because it's one thing to say, okay, that there's no documents on the program. Sure, that's fine, whatever. When you start taking shots in an actual person and say, no, no, he didn't work on that program at all. He had no responsibilities on ATIP. And his entire career at that point was talking about, not career, but, but, but post-resignation, his whole public persona was talking about his career as the director of ATIP. And so when that came out, I'm like, okay, I'm out. You know, like I don't want, I, I really at that point didn't want any part of it because I wasn't there to attack the man. I was there to critique the story. And even though there was a lot of bad rap that came along with that, like, oh, Greenwald's out to get him. Truly, I wasn't. I was trying to figure out what really was going on. What what really happened during ATIP? And yeah, ultimately, who is this man? Like, did he head it? Is this is this a government cover up? Is this a lie? You know, what what ultimately is it? But more than all else, it was about critiquing the story itself. The man just came along with it. So that was the big one. Now, it should be noted that in 2019, when this when this all kind of came about, Harry Reid, Senator Harry Reid, former majority leader, when Senator uh, when um, Luis Elizondo was was on the inside, he came out and vouched for Elizondo uh, just weeks ago. In fact, uh, about a month now it is uh, April 26th of this year. Senator Harry Reid restated his endorsement of Elizondo. I bring up the 2019 one just so you know uh, that he he although it wasn't as public as this one, Gotti Schwartz at MSNBC had had uh, or NBC had had essentially really put this into the limelight. But Harry Reid's been supporting Elizondo in his directorship of ATIP since 2019. So that is not new. The fancy letterhead with the Harry Reid signature, that is new. I had taken this letter just as a side note here to the Pentagon saying, OK, look, you guys have maintained this position for a very long time about Elizondo and he hasn't gone anywhere. He's continuing to do media interviews and making these claims. So clearly, whatever you guys are saying, it's not stopping him and he's getting international attention. So my aim and they've done it before was to correct that statement to have them alter it and say whatever it was that they were going to say based on new information and new evidence. And sadly, they still post this Harry Reid letter, maintain that position. Even as I'm talking to you today, they have not reneged 
Why? I don't, I don't know. But maybe that all plays a role into what happened as I was trying to track down a lot of this information. In order to prove or disprove the Pentagon, Elizondo, or both, you need that paper trail because the spokespeople, as we've proven, will change statements. They did that with me. So they will change their view. Although spokespeople, you can cite their answers, and there is a legal reason why I get spokespeople statements. They're le- they're, um, what's the right word to say this? I can legally cite them in an appeal, and they mean something because the DOD has, has authorized them to speak on their behalf. So if a spokesperson says something that negates a FOIA response, I can use that in an, in an appeal and generally they will they will take that and in fact it has worked i have provable examples of that so that their word as much as people hate them viciously and don't care unless they say something good but they don't care what the spokespeople say there's a reason i go for that and it is because it it, it means something so that paper trail is the only thing That is going to either prove or disprove what the spokespeople are saying and what is the quote unquote official stance of the Pentagon or the Department of Defense. One of those lines of 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 paper trails, one of many would be emails. Now, we know that Elizondo worked for the DOD. That has never been disputed, even with people that are highly critical, such as myself and throw everything through a fine tooth comb. That was never disputed. What was disputed on the side of the Pentagon was whether or not he headed this program. So what I started do, to do was dig into his emails and dig into the paper trail to prove or disprove what he was saying. Now, first up that came out was this FOIA response that you're looking at if you're watching this video, which was all about the emails between Luis Elizondo in August of 2017, I think the thread starts in September, but what you're looking at is in August, uh, August 9th to be exact. This is the paper trail that got the three original videos to uh, in December of 2017, and then the GoFast video in March of 2018 that got them reviewed. Now, according to Luis Elizondo in, in, in an interview that I did for this channel, He was unaware that these videos ended up in the public realm and he was unaware that to the stars Academy had them. And he thought for a bit while I interviewed him and he, uh, and he says that he does not think that he knew that they were publishing them at all uh, in December of 2017. So take that for what it's worth, but that is Elizondo's side of the story as we've kind of learned a little bit more. What he wanted to do was an internal database tracking these threats. Now he described them as drones and balloons, but uh, his explanation for that was he used the terminology because he couldn't inform Dopser on the reality that they were UFOs or, or more accurately now UAPs. Again, take that for what it's worth, but this was the paper trail to show how it all went down. And so my thought process was, look, if this will uh, add more to the story, then obviously there's more emails. I mean, the guy worked for the Pentagon for what, over a decade, a decade at least or so. So that's a heck of a paper trail. Something had to be said about ATIP, his directorship, UFOs, uh, whatever it may be. So I started digging in. I filed at least eight Freedom of Information Act requests specifically aimed to target Luis Elizondo's email. Now you can see here, because I've seen social media chatter on this, yes, he did have a DOD mailbox. Yes, he did have an email account. Yes, he did use it. Uh, That's all kind of um, safe assumptions, but I see a lot of people kind of firing at my article saying, well, maybe he didn't have one. Maybe he used private email. No, this was all through a legitimate DOD email, all provable with documentation. So my at least eight cases, because I think that there were more, but eight for, for me being able to verify for this, I started seeking emails from Elizondo's mailbox that contained some of these keywords, unidentified, a tip, OSAP, which is one of the other names that's connected to the ATIP program, UAP, 
Community of Interest, To the Stars, DeLong, Put Off. Obviously, you can see where I'm going with that. Obviously, you can see that I was seeking out a paper trail to see what was going on. Was he talking with To the Stars Academy? Was he talking about unidentified flying objects? Was he talking about UAPs? Was he talking about the ATIP program? All of that would come up in the course of this request. Now, a couple things uh, of note. When you file a FOIA request, you stipulate a time frame. That time frame that I stipulated was the entire career of Luis Elizondo while he worked for the DOD. Hence, that email address I just pointed out uh, to you would be used. I also put language in there that they may have more than one email address. That could be for whatever reason. And I stipulate that just to be safe, just to ensure that I get everything that I am looking for. Something really strange happened, though. You can see this was back in December of 2019. This specific case I use as the example because it's pretty much the most common sense. 19F1903. This was a request that I did for Luis Elizondo emails, all of them that contained the word unidentified. That was the specific request. The, re the final determination in December said there was not a single one. There were no records responsive to my request. You can see that uh, clear as day. After thorough searches of the electronic records and files, of no records, uh, excuse me, let me start over. Uh, after thorough searches of the electronic records and files of no records of the kind you described could be identified. Uh, sorry, I got a little tongue tied there, but that was how they said it. There was no records whatsoever. This wasn't the only case that was getting that. Others as well, ATIP, OSAP, unidentified, the one I just read you, all of them were coming back as no records. Nowhere did they say the box didn't exist to search. Not in a single letter. So I appealed almost every one. The ones that I had, I felt the evidence based on public testimony and what had been printed by other major media to appeal. I won every appeal that I submitted when it came to this particular topic because I had enough evidence. The appellate authority, which is not the action officer that is involved in uh, the FOIA request, meaning it goes to an, a higher office or a adjacent office, whatever, but it's the, not the same. They are the appellate authority that looks at my case and says, okay, Greenwald put up a case. Uh, there should be something. There should be no records. Uh, it should be uh, a, a response and not a no records response. So let's reopen this. They remand it back. It's called remanding back. They remand it back to OSD and they say, process this again. So I won all the appeals that I submitted on these cases. Fast forward now to April, April 1st to be exact. And yes, as I noted in my article, the irony is absolutely noted in my head. April 1st, 2021, I got another no records response on this 19F 1903 case where they said there is no records. However, this time there was new, new language. And I'll read it to you. Please note that emails of former Department of Defense employees are not retained unless they are considered historical records and retained by the National Records Center. There are currently no existing email accounts for Elizondo, for Mr. Elizondo. We believe that search methods were appropriate and could reasonably be expected to produce the re requested records if they existed. Now, remember those other emails that I showed you about earlier in this presentation? Here, now note this. Back to the letter. In regards to the records you forwarded responsive to your FOIA request number 18F0644, the Defense Office of Pre-Publication and Security Review Office located those records from their records system. Those records, which we released to you, were responsive to your request for all records slash correspondence relating to the DD Form 1910 sent to slash from Mr. Elizondo and their office. There were no other records located responsive to emails to slash from Mr. Elizondo in their records system. What does that mean in plain English? Simply this. What they were saying in the first paragraph I just read you was that everything is gone. They didn't save Elizondo's emails. It was more they were alluding to that, but I knew the writing was on the wall that they destroyed them. 
Now, don't worry. I didn't assume it. I do do have backup on, on that claim. So I assumed that they, that's where they were going with it. In my appeal, you could probably deduce from this that I used those original emails in my, in my uh, appeal as a basis to prove my case. Hey, there's got to be something responsive to this. They said that it was simply because they got it from Dopser, not Elizondo's email box, but rather the receiving end's email box. And so that was the only reason why they came up. Back to confirming that assumption, because to me, it's clear, but it wasn't clear enough. Remember, I always talk about triple and quadruple checking. This is why. Because if I ran to the internet and went, aha, they destroyed Elizondo's emails, I could potentially get bitten in the rear rear end by uh, assuming too much. And so I always try and figure out if I'm if I'm right uh, when it comes to assumptions or 99% uh, sure, but not 100. I always make sure it took two months, two months to confirm that this uh, confirm officially that this was saying it was destroyed. Now, when I say confirmed officially, I was waiting for approved language to publish. In two months, they could not produce it. Why that is, I'll let you guys guess. I don't know. I will say that I followed up well into the double digits trying to get those answers, trying to get the approved language. I knew by, by conversation that, yes, they were gone, and yes, they were standing by that, but I wanted to quote them beyond this letter. After nearly two months, we're just a couple days shy um, of the two-month mark after I first reach out, reached out for clarification, they still never gave me that language. But I said, look, I'm done waiting. I shouldn't be expected to wait forever. This is a final determination, and your letter speaks for itself. I'm just trying to give the courtesy that if I'm wrong and I'm reading this incorrectly, I don't want to lay down a you-know-what storm on you guys because I uh, essentially allege something that isn't true. So you need to tell me, is can you at least confirm, and I can fall back on this, can you at least confirm that they are 100% destroyed, deleted, however you want to say it, the data's gone, we can't access the emails, and there's no backup. And I was given that confirmation that I could then publish this article. They knew it. I was not going to blindside them. I said, I said, this is, this is what I'm doing. So if I'm wrong, now's the time to tell me. And they said, no, that, that, that no matter what, that they are standing by that. Um, and, and that was it. So there is no official statement beyond this letter. And was that frustrating? You better damn believe it, because I, again, in the double digits, was following up, trying to, to get that approved language and trying to be fair, as fair as possible to the other side. And in the process of being fair, I've known over the years and over the decades of filing FOIA requests, in order to delete government documents, you need authorization or an authority to do so, whether that be a presidential directive to destroy something, but more so what are called records retention schedules or records disposition schedules. In my attempt for clarification with the DOD, I specifically asked for that. They can say whatever they want uh, in addition to a, a records retention schedule, but I needed the citation. Now, in short, what those are, are records that ultimately define how long they keep government records based on type and subject matter, along with quite a bit else, but I'm giving you the nutshell. Every agency is different. Every type of document is different. There's very much a public perception. Oh, you can never delete a government record. It's illegal. Oh, it's absolutely legal. So when I knew that Elizondo's box was gone, I wanted the legal authority to do so because either this was a interesting story or this was a mind blowing story. Interesting because, well, it was legal and here's the records retention schedule, but darn it, we can't confirm 
Elizondo story or the Pentagon story about ATIP and his work. Or it was a mind blowing story. They couldn't cite one. There's no authority, and his box is just gone. It turned out to be a mind blowing story, in my opinion. Will I be proven wrong tomorrow because then all of a sudden the DOD kicks in with this record schedule that I couldn't find? Absolutely. That's a possibility. I'm waiting for it, though, because if 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 it takes two months for them not to produce that and then I publish this article and then like a day later, they are go, well, you know, why'd you make such a big to do? Here you go. Uh, then, yeah, I'll create a fairly big storm about that because I gave them nearly two months to produce that. But here's the bottom line. I don't think they will be able to. Before I published, I spent way too much time going through what you see on your screen here. These are the records disposition schedules for the Office of the Secretary of Defense and all the subcomponents therein. And there's a lot of them. The subcomponent therein that Luis Elizondo worked was this one here, the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence or OUSDI. I think now it's OUSDI and S, Intelligence and Security. So I think they've changed the name, but regardless. So he worked for this office here. You go through this records retention schedule. There's no mention of email. However, certain things I feel would apply, and so did Mr. Elizondo, but it wasn't good enough. What I did feel applied was something that I found after conversation with Elizondo. Now, here's what we determined as I was asking him questions, trying to figure out in all of these schedules, which, by the way, totals a ton of pages. It's not just, you know, one sheet. You have to go through all these different categories, and it stipulates how long. And I'll, sh I'll show you the uh, part of it in, in a second. But to try and figure out the categories and confusing is all heck. And, and, and especially for someone who doesn't deal with it every day, uh, it was a challenge. So I had it rounded down to a couple different things. I started talking to Elizondo about it and really kind of digging into his background. The thing that we that, that, that I had determined that then defined where he fit in the schedule was that he was called a non-capstone official. And that's important because documents in these schedules differentiate between non-capstone and capstone. If you're curious what that means, that's generally that they're a high senior level position uh, that is permanent. And so those capstone positions are generally more important than you would see like a low level contractor or something like that. So obviously much higher retention on something like that, uh, generally permanent, wherein low level contractors would be a, a much lower amount of time. He was a civilian employee, also defined in the schedules, and he was not a contractor, also differentiated in the schedule. Now, based on that and quite a few other things I won't bore you with, I had it rounded down then to something that I felt was to the T, and it ended up being to the T, which was found in Series 100 for all of you that are taking notes of the OSD records disposition schedules, subtitled General Office Records, and here, you, here it is. Email retention for non-capstone officials. Here's the description. All recorded information maintained in email accounts, regardless of classification, for current and incoming non-capstone OSD employees, civilian or military service members, supported by both DEE and non-DEE email systems, including personnel on the Secretary of Defense Network who are not designated as capstone officials. You'll note the key words that I just went through in conversation with Elizondo to try and figure all of this out. He fit to the T in this particular category from top to bottom. The key, look down here. The disposition, meaning how long do they keep it? It is temporary. It's cut off annually upon receipt, destroy seven years after cut off. Essentially, he's cut off on his resignation, December, or excuse me, October 4th, 2017. I know that based on his resignation letter, and I also got it later confirmed in writing by the DOD. That means that he's supposed to be there, that the documents are supposed to be there until October 4th, 2024. While I'm recording this, it is May 28th, 2028. What happened? 
I couldn't get a date of destruction. So I have no idea if it was within a day or a month or 30 days, uh, uh, six months, what, two years, three years? Doesn't matter. Documentation shows October 4, 2024, they should have kept. Some people thought emails just are deleted outright. I saw that on social media too. All sorts of theories going on around there. Well, again, this is 100% pertaining to email accounts, regardless of of classification. Let me take it one step farther. You can see here, it also applies to email messages and attachments, email calendars and appointments, email tasks, email chat transcripts, and other communications maintained on DEE or non-DEE systems. That acronym is Defense Enterprise Email, I think it is, uh, something to that effect. But regardless, it's DEE and non-DEE systems. So, you know, everything. And that's exactly what this story was about. So those that are firing kind of those skeptical shots at this, uh, just know it is spelled out. I even saw a well-known skeptic, one who I actually like, one who I hope will do an interview with me, not about this, but just because I like his work, immediately dismiss it publicly because it's normal or standard procedure or something like that. And it's like, did you even take, 10 seconds to read that, that I, that I have spent way too much time addressing that very point. It's not standard procedure. This I believe is the procedure seven years for those again, taking notes. I sent documents to Elizondo after I had established it's at least seven years. He was also looking at at categories that he felt applied. And I want to point out in series 500, that there are different sections which include intelligence and special subject files, general systems and policy correspondence and coordination. Uh, All of these different sections would apply, he felt, to him as well. Across the board of what he felt applied, it was a permanent retention. After 25 years after Elizondo retired or the document's uh, origination date, uh, either one, I believe, 25 years thereafter, It would be transferred over to the National Archives. Yet again, let me stress, permanent retention, never to be destroyed. So for those who want to talk about policy, go ahead. Because this shows that those records likely, and I'll say likely, should have been kept permanently. What I can comfortably prove is seven years. And we're still a couple years shy of when they were allowed to be destroyed. So what happened there? I don't know. But the fact that the boxes were deleted and they've known it as they were processing my requests, because I was told you're getting no records responses because the box doesn't exist. Well, I was told that in the last month. I was never told that in the last couple of years. And in fact, to prove that point even farther, I was not just filing FOIA requests and getting a no records and then appealing and that was it. Rather, throughout multiple cases, there were multiple instances of correspondence between me and the Freedom of Information Act action officers. This is one. The blurs are my own, just as a courtesy. But what I did was I was trying to make sure that the no records responses that they were giving giving me were based on searches that were CIPRNET, that were done on CIPRNET, NIPRNET, and JWIX accounts, meaning if you're not familiar with those systems, it's just a different levels of classification that they can communicate on. So let's say everything internally about ATIP was classified top secret. Well, that would be through JWix. Did they search it? From the action officer, I can confirm that we did do searches correctly. Sipper, Nipper, and JWix accounts. And they signed the letter. What does this prove? Why wouldn't they tell me way back in December of 2019 when I started winning my appeals Why wouldn't they tell me that it was gone? And I do have multiple examples. I link them in the article. I have multiple examples that if the government agency that you're requesting from destroyed records, they keep records of the destruction. So so they may not have the records anymore, but they have record of when they did it. The FBI is a prime example of just that. And I offer, again, examples in my article, but they'll say we believe that there were responsive records to your 
uh, request, or I believe they worded like uh, there may be responsive records pertaining to your request, but they were destroyed on July 1st, 1985. And you see that a lot with like the MJ-12 alleged members, uh, you know, not to work MJ-12 in there, but to use a related, somewhat related uh, example. A lot of those members have had portions or all of their files destroyed. And I've got the dates of almost all of them. So that's what happens when records are destroyed. But in this case, I was communicating with them about how they searched his email box. And yet here he, they are confirming, yes, we, can, we searched all three networks. But by the way, the boxes are deleted, so it's m m a moot. It's a waste of time. No, none of that. And instead, I spent all that time filing appeals. The appellate authority within the Department of Defense, who I guarantee you don't work for cheap, they spent all that time then reviewing my material, remanding it back to the action officers. Then those action officers wasted all that time doing all of these searches again on what, what were they searching and why wouldn't they tell me? And it wasn't until April of 2021 where they finally did. One of the other things in their letter, and let me go back to that screen really quick. Former DOD employees are not retained unless they are considered historical records and retained by the National Records Center. What I want to bring up now is a provable, undeniable aspect of Luis Elizondo's background, largely overlooked. I've seen it mentioned by a few people, but largely overlooked. And that is his his job title when he resigned. And when he resigned, he was the director of the National Programs Special Management Staff or the NPSMS. Now, what is that office? And, and so when I saw his resignation letter, and, and yeah, I had concerns on whether or not it, it was even real because it leaked out and it was kind of found through nefarious ways. But nobody's ever disputed it. And Luis Elizondo himself, I think, has even made reference to it. So and then History Channel published it when Unidentified aired. So, you know, a couple years ago, it was like, OK, well, then I guess this is real. And that office, I started digging in, trying to figure out, OK, a tip aside, you know, what what are these? what is this office? You know, what, what is, what is he doing? What was his job title? What was, how many people were underneath him? What was going on? Was this code for an, a UFO office? Was this something else? And at that time, when it first came out, there was nothing. If you Googled that, that title, you'd only come up to references to Elizondo's uh, resignation letter. And that was it. There was nothing else. Not that Google's the end all be all, but you know what I mean? You search for Secretary of Defense, you're going to come up with 22 billion documents. So it wasn't like that at all. So I started digging in deep. And the only, at this point, the only official government documents that I was able to come up with were military court transcripts from the Office of Military Commissions on the trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or KSM. Yes, the 9-11 mastermind. And if you've subscribed to this channel a lot, one of the first videos I did was actually about these documents. And uh, I said then that I'll say now, I'm sure Luis Elizondo has seen a lot and knows a lot, obviously working into highly classified settings and programs. And in this particular transcript, it was proven that number one, the attorney for KSM was talking about the NPSMS because they were the quote SAP access people. Here's another part of the transcript when NPSMS came up and the NPSMS is the office. It states the NPSMS is the office responsible for administering the special access program for the office of military commissions. And it was a line of questioning and it essentially went into, yes, that is what they do. I confirmed with Luis Elizondo, that this not only was his office, but he was there around this time frame. You can see uh, October 2017 uh, kind of put two and two together, although he retired uh, earlier that month. Obviously, this was something that had been ongoing for years. Other than confirming, yes, that is him. And yes, uh, he was there. He wouldn't expand anywhere else, which I totally understand. Going back to that, if it's not a historical record, 
it's not saved. This is litigation of the 9-11 mastermind. If they are really going to argue that if Luis Elizondo himself or his office, whichever, was communicating with KSM's attorney, and, and the background of why this came up was that one of the interpreters for the defense lost his SAP access uh, because they needed special clearance to work and, and potentially see what might be very sensitive or classified information, that they had to select, vet, and then give SAP access to not only the interpreters, but the defense and so on. That came up in the trial. If you're telling me that's not historical and, and something that is involved in litigation and potential evidence that could be that could be called on by an attorney, that that's not historical and they just delete it, no way. There's none. It doesn't matter if you believe Luis Elizondo at all about his ATIP story or not. There is no way that anybody can tell me when you look at the actual evidence about what we know for a fact that Luis Elizondo did, that his email box would just be zzz, wiped clean and all of that stuff is gone and ATIP material should it be there was just crossed, uh, uh, you know, cross, uh, deleted off the face of the map. There's no way. I don't buy it at all. And those records retention schedules sealed the deal for me. And the lack of ability that they couldn't cite one also was very telling. Because again, those FBI cases unrelated to this can cite those dates when I request them. So something is super fishy around here. One thing that I have shied away from for quite some time is this lady here who I deal with. And maybe after this video, we'll never deal with again, <laughs> not by choice, but because uh, maybe somebody's watching. But I think it should be noted. And what I'm saying here is citable with documentation and historical fact. It, back in 2003, Susan Goff, who is the Pentagon spokesperson, who is the sole spokesperson for UFO related inquiries from the mainstream media, anything related to Elizondo, anything related to the UAP task force. And she fields all of that from not only the Pentagon slash DOD, but all the components thereof, the Air Force, the Defense Intelligence Agency, OSD, the US Navy, on and on. She is at this point and has been for some time, the only one that will talk about it. If you now uh, look into her background, and you look that back in 2003, the evolution of strategic influence by Lieutenant Colonel Susan L. Goff, where this comes into play, and I have not talked about this at all until the last week. The reason is, is that she, and I'll, I'll read it to you just to make sure that I don't mess it up. And I'll read the part of my article that deals with this, because this is cause for concern not only by myself as a researcher investigator, but should be a concern to the general public. Let me read to you what I, what I wrote and then also in turn quoting her paper. Goff's background prior to commenting on UAPs for the Pentagon has not made her popular to many online UFO disclosure advocates. In 2003, she authored a strategy research project where she wrote that the quote, orchestrated combination, unquote, of public diplomacy, psychological operations, and public affairs is the definition of what is called strategic influence. She adds that the DOD need she adds that quote, the DOD needs someone with the appropriate position and authority to oversee the policy and to coordinate DOD strategic influence activities among DOD public affairs military psyop and other military information activities. Do you feel that the person that is the sole person tasked to comment on UAPs, do you believe that they are more focused on the truth or do you believe based on this, they are more focused on strategically influencing the public. 
And that is the biggest concern that I have and have had for quite some time, but have kept quiet on it because we are forced to work with this individual and it will hurt posing these types of questions, but they need to be posed because after what I reported on yesterday and what no one has yet been able to disprove, and I am open to it, if they deleted the paper trail to either prove or disprove Luis Elizondo, the big fat question mark is why? Because if it was if it was not authorized, if there was nothing that legally allowed them to do it, why did they do it? And if there was some type of authority that allowed them to do, do this, whether a publication or otherwise, a disposition schedule or otherwise, whatever it may be, then cite it. Because after nearly two months of someone who has dug in for three years and wasted an untold amount of time, let alone inside the Pentagon, wasting all that time from the appellate authority to the action officers of the Freedom of Information Act to the process of, of having to, in the double digits, follow up to the people that I needed to follow up with asking for clarification on this. How much wasted time, money, and resources is that? All for what? Strategic influence? Or was that the truth? And it just so happened to play out that way. That is the issue that what we are dealing with that plays into, again, the heart and soul and core of why I do what I do with the Black Vault. Because we need the answers. We need the truth, not only because of this topic and it deserves it, but because of Luis Elizondo and the fact that he deserves it. The fact that if, yeah, I'll say myself, or if anybody else was used in a pawn in a strategic influence operation, call it whatever you want. But if it was not based on truth and we were just used as pawns to relay that message, what is that saying about this topic and about how the general public is treated. Now, to the powers that be, that may be cringeworthy. How could John go conspiratorial? The reason is, is because the do documentation tells me to be. The evidence is there that something is going on. It's clear for decades we haven't had the whole truth. I've been touting that line for 25 years, since 15. It's obvious. The evidence is there. But what type of strategic influence are they doing now? And who may be suffering in the process? As always, I am interested in your thoughts. Please feel free to post them right down there into the comment box here on YouTube. If you're watching anywhere else, let me know because YouTube's the only place you should be able to, watch, uh, to be able to watch this. But if you're listening, there are tons of audio podcast platforms, including Spotify and Apple iTunes and wherever you get your podcast, you'll find the Black Vault Radio where this presentation and many others go down to audio form. So you'll miss out on the audio visual part, or excuse me, the visual part of the audio visual presentation, but make sure that you subscribe. And I always aim for five stars. The biggest help you guys can give me is that five star review, but an honest review. So if it's four, to, if it's less than that, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, and also a thumbs up and a subscribe here on YouTube. If you are listening and aren't familiar with the YouTube channel, make sure you go to the blackvault.com slash live. That will bounce you to the YouTube channel where I do stuff like this all the time, or at least as much as I can. And it's a lot of fun. But as I always say, thank you guys for listening, watching. And this is John Greenwald Jr. signing off. And we'll see you next time.